This is Digital Marketing Depot, broadcasting live. I'm Karen Burka, your webinar producer. Thank you for joining us today for Key Marketing Ops Capabilities to Boost Revenue. We are very pleased to welcome John Donlin, Senior Research Director, Marketing Operations Strategies at Serious Decision, and Alan Pogorzelski, Vice President of Marketing at OpenPrize. Before I turn the webinar over to our speakers, I want to tell all of you a couple of things. If you need some help or have a question for our speakers, just use the Q&A box, and we will do our best to help you. If you want to tell a friend, check out our sponsor, OpenPrize, or Digital Marketing Depot. There are some widgets at the bottom of your screen. Just click on them, and they will take you where you want to go. Remember, you can customize your audience console to move or resize any windows that you have open. We're going to hear a lot of great content today, so I wanted to let you know we are recording this broadcast, and we will make it available for viewing on demand this afternoon. I'll send an email out when it's ready. So with that business taken care of, let me make some more formal introductions. John Donlin is a dynamic, results-driven leader who thrives on helping organizations accelerate the maturity of their business operations. He has more than 20 years of experience in marketing operations as both a practitioner and consultant. Alan Pogorzelski leads the marketing team at OpenPrize, where he's helping marketers solve the problems with data and business processes that he's faced throughout his 20 years in marketing. Prior to OpenPrize, he led marketing at both large companies and startups, including Selectica, CypherCloud, and SoftChain. Now, you can see more complete bios and contact information for our speakers on the left side of your audience console. Remember, if you have questions for our industry experts, please make good use of that Q&A box. I'll get to as many of those questions live after the formal presentation. So before I turn the webinar over to John Donlin to get us started, we've got a question for you, audience. Our speakers are very interested in tailoring their content to your level of expertise. So um, here's a question for you. We want you to rate on a scale of one to five how you would say your company's overall marketing capabilities are today. Now, we've had a little fun with these responses. Just choose one. You're a five. We're superheroes. You're a four. It's like Lake Wobegon. You're all above average. Number three, you're okay, but don't ask for anything off the menu. Maybe you're a two. It's a really a work in progress. Not really good, but you're hoping to get better. Or one, help. That's why you're here today. So think about that as you click on your response. I'll just remind you again that both John and Alan will be here at the end of their formal remarks to answer your questions. And if we move a little fast for you today and you want to hear the webinar again, we will have it available on demand later today. You can always listen in again at your convenience. Let's take a look at these results. All right. We look like we've got a middle of the pack group here. I'm going to bring John Donlin here to take a look at the results with me. John, we've got almost half say they're okay, but you know, you got to stick with the menu. Um, 10% yeah. are superheroes, and we've got another almost 24% uh, saying they're all in pretty above average, but we still have nearly 20% who really need some help from you two today. Yeah, this is this is interesting to take a look at, Karen. I mean, if you turn this on its side, it's it's really almost a normal distribution, you know, kind of a regular bell curve, <laughs> um, which is uh, which is interesting. It's sort of a, a perfect setup. So, I mean, I think the good news is, uh, no matter what what category you sit in, I think we've got something for you today on this webcast. Um, you know, for for the helpers, the hey, I'm, that's why I'm here today. I think there'll definitely be a lot of um, solid and practical tips. And even for the ones that are uh, a little bit above average or superheroes, there should be some things that can help you really optimize what you're doing around your, your profile data. So, um, so this is good to know. This really helps set the stage for the rest of the webcast. All right, great. Well, I'm going to kick things off here and um, just share – um, a little bit of perspective of some of the things that we're seeing uh, from the serious decisions perspective. And one of those I wanted to share is um, what, what we just introduced to the market recently. It's called our B2B technology universe. And really what we do is this is kind of a different approach from what you might see out there. Um, I know there's a lot of uh, small fonts uh, on here, but this is a way of looking at the various technologies that you could potentially use in marketing, and in fact, across sales, marketing, and products. And what we've done is we've taken a look at these, um, these disciplines across the revenue engine, 
and then broken it down further into the subfunctions within those areas. So you see, you know, there's an area for account-based marketing, for marketing ops, um, for demand creation, et cetera. And then within those are the technology categories that you would potentially use. So rather than listing individual vendors, for example, uh, we use this star schema to help represent what those categories are. You'll see some of those same categories represented in different areas because some of different teams will use the same category. But it really helps us orient um, us in terms of, you know, what is it we're trying to do, not what category do you want to buy in. Um, this has been really helpful for, for our clients, and it's really more of a, a capabilities or a business requirements based approach at trying to understand the different tech that's out there. Um, and so, you know, one of the areas that we're going to focus on today is within that marketing operations space. There's an area called profile data management, and we're going to talk a lot about what it means to um, work with your contact and account data, that firmographic demographic information, keep it fresh, um, have a plan for governance in place and that sort of thing. Um, so so that's, that's kind of where we're operating today um, uh, on this webcast in terms of the tech universe. So one thing I wanted to, you know, another thing I wanted to share with you is, you know, within this world, um, and especially as it concerns that profile data, um, again, that contact and account data that we're looking at, uh, where can marketing ops help? You know, what can we do as marketing ops professionals to help our, uh, our friends in demand creation and in portfolio marketing and in some of the more forward-facing marketing areas to enable them to use great data? And, you know, there's a, there's a few things that we can do. One of them is to really help them understand um, market intelligence that's out there. So what is our, uh, our total addressable market? How does that boil down into the set of accounts that we're going to go after, particularly if we're chasing an account-based marketing strategy? Uh, and then boil that down into the buying centers, the buying groups, and then ultimately the personas and actual people that we'll need to reach out to. There's been, a, you know, really a big shift in the industry in the last uh, few years, certainly to account-based marketing, but in the last couple of years around really trying to understand what that buying group looks like. So not just the main decision maker, but who are the collection of people that come together on a temporal basis to make a buying decision? What does that group look like? How is it, how is it put together? And so we have to, you know, as marketing ops, we can help identify those things all the way up from, you know, the total addressable market all the way down to who those individuals might be. Now, to do that, we're going to have to make some changes, um, potentially, in our data model and in how we store that data. Um, you know, if you're familiar with serious decisions, you know that a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, we released the demand unit waterfall, which is um, our next iteration on, um, on our traditional waterfall, and it really focuses on the idea of demand units. And demand units are essentially uh, a buying group that has an interest in a particular solution. You know, they have a need, and that probably lines up with a particular solution that you have. And so that, it, it highlights what we had been hearing from, from the market, that there really is this emphasis on, on buying groups. And so there are some changes that you may need to make to your marketing automation platform or your Salesforce automation platform to be able to accommodate that. Uh, particularly around cre the creation of a buying group of that entity. You know, we don't always think about that uh, sort of thing, let alone represent it in, in systems. Um, and then what are the personas that represent those buying groups? Um, and so ultimately, you know, this all comes back to um, contact and account data that we'll need, to, we'll need to keep track of. We'll need to group it a little bit differently, uh, but it's going to be critical. And for those, you know, for those marketing ops clients that we work with that are starting to think like this, they are... Um, leaps and bounds ahead of the competition in terms of organizing their data, organizing that contact information in a way that makes sense um, for, their, um, for their internal constituents. So, you know, when we think about making that shift, there are really three areas uh, that you need to think about. You need to think about what are we doing in terms of leads versus contacts. Uh, we want to think about what's happening with those buying groups and the personas that comprise them. How can we represent them? And then there are going to be some scoring implications that change as well. And these are all things that marketing ops can take the lead on, um, that they can, they can have more of an advisory or a consultative role um, when we look at these three areas. So this, you know, we'll use this construct here, these three key areas, as the, um, uh, as the structure for the rest of the webcast um, as we go through them. And so the first one that we can look at are leads and contacts. And what's different? Well, you know, one thing I would say is that, you know, data hygiene has always been at a premium, 
um, in the past. I think it's even more so today to have a crisp understanding of who those contacts are, what their, um, you know, what their title is, what their role is at the organization, what their role is in the buying group. So what persona they line up to, and are they a decision maker or a ratifier, you know, or, or a champion, or maybe just an influencer? What role do they play in the buying process? So to be able to correctly identify who those people are and the role they play uh, is, is absolutely critical in all this. You know, another interesting thing is that um, we need to be able to link the activity um, of that contact to a specific solution. So one of the things that we, we need to do in this more progressive uh, world that we're moving to is to understand, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a contact. I've been poking around on the website. I downloaded a white paper. I've been doing different things. But relative to what solution, what does it seem like I'm interested in? That's one of the distinguishing characteristics when we look at demand units and we say, okay, you know, that person is going to be part of a buying group and that buying group is going to have an interest in a certain solution. So we want to be able to map that. Keeping your account hierarchy straight is, is super important as well. Um, you know, we work with a lot of organizations that, um, you know, they might inherit kind of the industry version of what an account hierarchy looks like, kind of the, the, uh, the legal entity definition of what that account tree looks like. But everybody's got their own version of how they, uh, how they view accounts. Sometimes they collapse those levels. Sometimes they expand them horizontally. And so to be able to translate that into your own uh, view of those accounts is, is really critical. And, you know, for, for matching, for, um, to be able to move from leads over to contacts as they move across from the marketing automation platform into the Salesforce automation platform, we need to be able to do things like, you know, suss out the dupes. Um, we've, got to, we've got to use things like level and function and job role to be able to match up contacts that might already be in the database so that we have one complete picture of what that one person is doing and not see them in there a couple of different times. You know, and then the last thing I'd call out here is just that we've got to be hypersensitive to privacy issues um, around the globe. You know, certainly GDPR, having gone into effect this past May, um, has been uh, extremely important for um, to be able to keep track of uh, uh, clients and prospects that are European Union citizens and to be compliant with the privacy regulations there. But, you know, e-privacy is, is coming right on the heels of GDPR. Um, we're seeing some, um, even in the United States, some states are starting to enact stricter data privacy uh, laws. So this is something that, you know, at Sirius we've been preaching is it's really an opportunity to be a better marketer, um, as to not just, uh, you know, go buy a list somewhere, but if you, if you have that contact information to reach out and work with those people, form a relationship that you both want to have. You know, it can be a little bit frustrating at, at first to, um, to say, hey, we, we might have to get rid of some names in the database because we just don't have their permission um, to be able to work with them. But at the end of the day, it forms a better relationship and it makes you a better marketer. You know, you're, you're forming a relationship with someone who wants to have a relationship with you. So there are a number of things to, to think about when we're looking at, uh, at leads uh, and contacts. You know, we're seeing a lot of organizations are moving away from using the lead object and just use the contact object and then connect those to opportunities. Um, so there, there are a lot of considerations there, and data hygiene really is, uh, it, you know, is, is uh, front and center among all of those. And Alan, I know you've got some uh, some great tips and tricks around that that uh, that can help the, the folks on the webcast in that regard. Uh, I sure do. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, I'd like to share with you just some of the, the the basic best practices that we've seen around data cleansing projects that we've done over the years. Um, you know, we, we see the same patterns in terms of what organizations are doing, the issues that they're facing, and, uh, and, and how they're resolving them. So I'm going to try and cut to the chase here and focus on the things that will make an immediate difference for you up front. Um, and, and the first one I want to talk about is, is a data governance plan. Now, the, the reality is that you need this at most companies because uh, sales operations generally runs a Salesforce or our Dynamics 365 instance and marketing operations in demand tend to run uh, their Marketo or Eloqua or Pardot marketing automation instance. Um, and in most cases, these two tools have bi-directional communication between them, so it's very difficult to do something on one side of the house without affecting the other one. Um, and those teams tend to have very different goals. And so what we found is that the first thing that it makes sense to do is just sit down with your counterparts in, in the sales organization if you're in marketing or, or vice versa. And, and talk about some very basic structures in terms of who owns what, in terms of what those key fields are and who's going to be responsible for keeping them clean, 
what is going to be the source of data when uh, cleansing enrichment needs to happen, and uh, what are those standard field values? You know, for instance, when you're uploading a list of leads, are you going to say, great, every time we upload the state field, it needs to be two characters or it needs to be written out? Um, you know, if we're targeting industries and that's very important for you, you know, what are the, the 10 to 20 really important target industries that will make segmentation easier going forward? Um, and what we found, though, is if you're able to sit down with your counterparts and just have a conversation about this, um, the entire process of cleaning up your data will go so much faster. And uh, th this doesn't have to be a big ordeal. As a matter of fact, you know, th there's a couple simple spreadsheets that you can download from our site, Open Price Tech. Um, that work for Marketo and for Salesforce and Pardot and Eloqua, um, that you can just fill out the spreadsheet. And, and we found that a 30-minute to an hour-long conversations with your counterparts in the other departments will make your project go much, much faster than it would otherwise. Now, now the second best practice is, is really about how data gets into the system. Um, there are more than a few marketing organizations out there where everybody on the team wants to be able to add Marketo or a local or part out to their resume because these are hot areas that are worth a great deal of money. Um, and there's certainly been more than a little bit of turnover on the marketing operation side, particularly here in the Bay Area, um, where the mean tenure of a person in that department tends to be 12 to 18 months at best. Um, what we found, though, is when you have multiple people who are simply uploading the data without taking a look at data quality first and, and data standardization first, you end up with a, a really dirty database that catches up with you later on when you want to do segmentation or, or, or personalization or attribution. Um, so my suggestion, you know, given what we've seen before, is number one, uh, create that data governance template, and number two, identify one person, one backup person that will upload the data all of the time. And that will ensure that there's consistency there, that the spreadsheets that they're uploading have exactly the same normalized fields every single time, which is really important because just about every event you'll go to or syndicated content program work with or webcast provider will have its own different values. Um, so definitely spend the extra time, designate that one person, uh, document what you're doing, and you'll be far, far better off. Um, and even better, if you have the infrastructure to do this, uh, automating this process makes even more sense um, and will make things go a whole lot faster. You know, I had uh, one company that we work with, which was a, a very large consultancy, was taking three to five weeks in many cases for large events to get their stuff into the system. Um, so they, they would attend a big event like Dreamforce, literally get thousands of leads, uh, cleanse them by hand in an offshore organization, and then upload them. Um, that generally doesn't scale very well, uh, and generally you don't get the quality and consistency you need. If you're able to automate that, uh, you can get consistent results across the board and get those leads loaded up in minutes. Uh, so uh, many organizations that work with us that attend those big events like Dreamforce are actually able to upload those leads in near real time. So salespeople at an event can identify really hot prospects at the event and schedule dinners and meetings uh, all while the, that event is still going on makes a tremendous difference in the effectiveness of the campaigns, and it also gets people out of the, uh, the business of doing manual cleansing, which uh, nobody in marketing operations went to college to do. Now, one other thing that I want to point out um, is, is that many of the people we talk with, they, they say that they've got a, an attribution problem where they're trying to identify what campaigns are producing opportunities and revenues. Or they say they've got a routing problem where, where so many of the leads are going to the wrong people. Um, or they say they have a segmentation problem where they, they really can't put people into the right nurturing campaigns based on things like industry or based on, on uh, the functional area that they're in. And in reality, what I've seen is the vast majority of times the, the root cause of their problem isn't these things in and of themselves, but the data behind them. And they actually have a data quality problem. Um, and, and as you look at your data, my, my suggestion here in terms of a best practice is, is start simple and build on those so that each additional step in the process uh, can build on the previous step. So for example, in step one here in this graph, we talk about cleaning up your data and just looking for the obvious typos. Uh, things like dot coms that, sh dot coms that should be dot com. Um, obvious uh, typos over here, like New York. Um, and once you've got them done, then you can start to normalize your data. 
And by normalize, I mean, you know, these, this is correct data, but it just needs to be fit to your standards. So, um, for example, saying, boy, you know, Connecticut should be spelled out or Connecticut should be two letters. Uh, you never want to have both in there. Next thing you know, you've got 150, 200, and even more states as people add typos to them. Um, you want 50 of those. Um, same with things like phone numbers. If you've uh, standardized country and you've standardized and you have a phone number, it's really easy then to normalize that format so the auto dialers can use them and your sales team could be more effective. Um, once you've done your normalization, then it makes sense to fill in the gaps as well too. Um, uh, you, know, for, you, you may be able to infer, for instance, if you've got a zip code, then you can go back and double check and make sure you've got the right states and the right city to go along with it. Um, and then from there, do the more complex stuff like segmentation. So, you know, you may, if you have the right job level and you have the right job function, then you can start to throw people in the right buyer personas and then put them in the, night, in the right nurturing tracks. Um, and, and only then should you do the more advanced stuff, like, you know, things like territory assignment, uh, things like deduplication. Um, each of these steps in the process can build on each other. And if you're not going to automate this stuff, um, it makes sense to do it in a very disciplined, rigorous way, starting with the simple stuff and moving to the more complex things. So uh, one of the best practice I want to talk about is, is, is duplicates. And um, that is such a critical thing in just about anything you want to do in marketing operations because it affects your ability to do good attribution, to do good scoring or good routing. Um, you know, routing in particular, if you have a lead owned by one person and a contact owned by a second person um, and an account owned by a third person, um, you're, you're going to come across all kinds of issues with routing, and that's even before you deal with the normal issues of product interest or partner relationships or uh, people coming and going out of the organization. Um, all of these things uh, are really affected by duplicates. So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the steps you need to do. First of all, certainly you want to clean up your database first before you, you start dealing with duplicates. Uh, it'll be a whole lot easier to identify them that way. Um, in, in terms of how you do it, if you're not going to use a, a tool, uh, my suggestion is you take these three steps. Uh, first of all, you decide how you're going to identify duplicates. And while that sounds obvious in a lot of people's minds, yeah, we'll start with email address because that's a primary key in Salesforce. Um, in a lot of the companies that we're talking with, there's a concept of legitimate dupes that happen. Um, companies that, for instance, work with distributors could have three or four different uh, leads that are all legitimately different uh, because the people are representing different companies. Uh, the second thing to really think through um, is about when you are able to identify a duplicate, what's the systematic way that you'll decide which record stays? And you should run from anyone who tells you that all duplicates should be merged the same way. Uh, your business is, has unique issues compared to every other one, and there is no perfect answer for this. Um, uh, you know, some companies might say, boy, you know, I want to use the first lead in, and that one should be the most important one. Um, but the reality is there are companies where you have diligent salespeople who will upload 10,000, 20,000 leads in their name from, uh, from their personal Rolodex. And when they do that, suddenly your attribution is thrown off, and, and that person's lead database suddenly becomes an immensely successful campaign. Um, uh, other companies will say, boy, you know, the, the record that I should count on is the one associated with the actual customer record rather than the lead, uh, because that one is more, is more likely to be correct since it happened most uh, more recently, and it's actually tied to revenue, um, and there's a bill that actually comes out to those people. Um, you need to sit down with your team and, and make some consistent decisions about it um, and then document it. Um, and then, you know, the last thing is about, you know, how are we going to merge all these together? And again, you, you need to sit down with your entire team, come up with a consistent set of logic, even if you're not going to automate it, and make sure that you apply that over and over again. Uh, otherwise, you're going to see some very, very interesting things um, in your attribution. Um, and um, one last thing as we, uh, as we talk about this topic of data hygiene. Oops. Um, and that is a lead to account matching. Oops. Sorry about that. And lead to account matching is critical for just about anything that you want to do, particularly as you develop more sophisticated models. You need to do things like lead to opportunity matching, lead to buyer group matching, lead to demand unit matching. 
uh, some simple best practices is always start with a domain first. But um, that's a really great first start. Um, second, then take a look at the name. Uh, you, you don't want to start with the name first and go with domain. And second, make, or third, make sure that you strip off all the superfluous stuff. And there's an entire list of these keywords, for instance, uh, in websites like uh, marketingopendata.org. So you can get rid of those keywords and you have a much more exact match. Oh, there are a couple of other things I'd like to talk about, too, on this topic. Um, first of all, the, the, the first one in terms of really complex topics is, is working with multiple data providers. Um, you know, there, there's the sense out there that if you just work with a third-party data provider, then everything will be fine. You don't need to do any cleansing and enrichment. Um, and the reality is that's almost, almost never true. Um, and, and it's that way for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that when you work with most third-party data providers, you can expect a reasonable match rate of only 30 to 40%. Um, and that means it's going to be really tough to use just one, and it means that the majority of your data isn't going to be cleaned up and standardized. Um, you know, we did a survey last year of over 200 B2B marketers around third-party data, and we found that the ones that, that were actually happiest with their data were ones that were working with three or more data providers. So that, uh, that seems to support this notion that yeah, one of them just isn't going to get the job done. Um, now, you need to keep in mind, though, that when you do this, um, and if you work with multiple data providers, there are going to be some differences in key fields, like industry and company size. You know, one, company might, or one provider might say, boy, I've got a range of 250 to 500 employees, and then 500 to 1,000. Another one might just have uh, basic numbers and say, oh, yeah, there's 500 employees here, 551. Um, so if you do work with multiple providers, you do need to put the effort into normalizing data across all of them to your standards uh, and orchestrating the process of choosing which one to use where. Um, one of the well-known search engines that we work with and, and work with their data actually uses over seven different providers depending on, uh, on the area that, of, that they're focusing on any given day. Um, now, one other thing that I want to recommend is, uh, is that you automate as much as you possibly can because this is, uh, this is something that doesn't scale any other way. Um, and the last recommendation around multi working with multiple data providers is uh, you want to spend the extra effort to vet every provider for what you need to do. And, and I'll give you an example of how you might want to do that. Um, rather than just saying, hey, send me, you know, here's a sample of 1,000 uh, 1, people or email addresses, enrich that for me. Uh, my suggestion to you, and we, and we found that our customers are, are really, really thankful when they take, they take this approach, is they start by picking a buyer persona, uh, which has uh, a company size in it and a job function and a job level in it. Um, and they ask that third-party data provider that they're considering to send over all of the records in their database that meet that, uh, excluding all the information that makes it uh, that, that makes it possible to target that person. So, so I might say, for instance, send me over um, all your marketing ops titles for companies with under 500 people. Uh, uh, send me the company name and the title, but not the person, phone number, email address, anything like that. Uh, we, we found some amazing things when we do that. You know, we had one company, for instance, that was about to spend $30,000 with a provider. Uh, they followed our advice and they found out, you know, number one, there was only seven new target accounts that they got back that they didn't really have. Um, and, and number two, they only got a couple hundred names uh, that they didn't already have in the database from previous providers, so that, that provider would not have provided any value to them. So uh, definitely do your homework there. Yeah, okay. we're, we're moving ahead a bit here. Let me uh, send it over to you, John, um, and you can hit the next area. I think we've kind of beaten that one to death. Yeah, sure. Absolutely, Alan. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, you tackled a, a number of good topics here, actually, um, you know, in that last section. I loved what you had to say about the, the governance and what you recommend. That's right in line with what we say. You know, you want to get a cross-functional team together uh, on your data governance council. First of all, you want to have a data governance council, and then you want to get folks not just from um, ops, but the more forward-facing areas like demand managers and salespeople so they can tell you about the frontline problems that they're having with the data. I thought that was great. What you said about um, the dupes was really helpful, too. I feel like 
you know, I was, I was a practitioner, um, just like a lot of the folks on the line here, um, before I, um, moved over to Sirius and I always wrestled with dupes. They always seemed like such a mystery. Um, you never really know how many you have. That's kind of the nature of them. Um, but there's some really good tips in there. And then, you know, one of the things you said too was around personas. And I liked how in that five step process, the matching of personas was, I think it was step four out of five. So you want to get all your data clean before you even want to try and match to personas. And I think that's a, that's a really important point because we see, um, we start working with some of our clients. They'll kind of go out of order, uh, in terms of what you had there. Um, and it just, it just won't work. You know, you need clean data to be able to, to match to personas. So, you know, speaking of personas and, um, and, and the buying group. So this is, this is a little bit of our second section. And, you know, it's really important for marketing operations to lead the charge here on figuring out who are those buying groups within an account? What are the typical buying groups that you sell to? Again, you know, you know, those four to six people or whatever the number might be that comprise the team that ends up making the buying decision. And then what are the personas that, um, that sit in that buying group? Um, you may have multiple buying groups that you sell into. You know, you might send, sell into the benefits administration group within HR, and that's a buying group. You might sell into IT, and they've got their own buying group. Um, so you want to you want to be able to suss out exactly what those are and what the personas are that comprise them, because then when you get your data clean, then you'll be able to match actual contacts, like Alan was saying, to those personas, and you'll understand what the actual buying groups are at certain accounts, um, and you can start marketing to them um, effectively. So you know a, a few things to consider here. Um, you know as you're implementing this. What we found, especially with folks that are implementing the demand unit waterfall, um, they will try to use the, uh, the contact role object to represent a contact that sits in a buying group. Um, the problem is that's not a customizable object, so a lot of organizations will um, create a custom object um, that is essentially buying group member. You know, it may not have that name um, or buying group contact, um, something along those lines, so that you can link an actual person um, and the persona and the buying group that they potentially belong to, to um, the very real buying group that sits underneath um, that account. Another thing that you're, you're going to want to think through is, um, does that persona play more than one role, potentially, across buying groups? So if you've got a CIO, for example, they may be the decision maker uh, in one buying group. They may just be an influencer in another. Um, so, you know, what you want to do is think through what, again, what those buying groups are, the personas that comprise them. There, there's a little bit of a technology choice to be made here as to whether you represent those in your SFA as actual new objects or tables, uh, reference tables that you might use for lookup, or whether you're just going to hard code some of these things in the creation of your, of your demand units or opportunities. But um, the idea is that you want to think through all of these things um, so that you um, – uh, so you understand what that typical composition looks like, and then as the very real people start interacting with you, you can, um, you know, you can start to fill those in from the shell that you've created. Uh, the, second, the second thing that I'd say is actually our third section I'd set up is a little bit around scoring. And, um, you know, scoring gets interesting when you start thinking about um, these buying groups. And so we're no longer doing just lead scoring. It's no longer, you know, oh, Alan don't, downloaded a white paper and he attended one of our events um, and he clicked through on a few emails, so let's calculate his score and see what he's been doing. It's really now based on the collective score of that buying group. And so that's a little bit, a little bit of a shift. Um, again, from a technology perspective, you can put some things in place to be able to account for that. Um, in the SFA, you've got to kind of work around the contact role uh, object, but the idea is that you want to now aggregate the scores of the people that are in that buying group to understand if that demand unit or opportunity, and a lot of our clients are using opportunities to represent demand units, are progressing through the waterfall at the right scoring thresholds. Um, a little nuance here is, to think about is that, you know, if Alan and I, for example, were part of the same buying group, his interactions may matter a whole lot more than my interactions. And so I may have done a lot of things. Um, but if he downloads that one white paper, well, that could send the, the score of the buying group through the roof. Um, so you want to think about weighting personas differently. And again, you know, you can't do any of this unless you've got the clean data that links um, what your theoretical score is going to be back to the actual uh, contacts in the database. 
So a lot of times what we'll see is we'll figure out, you know, we'll look at the total addressable market, we'll see, look at the active market, we'll do that kind of based on, um, based on a lot of profile data, um, but then as people take actions and they're showing activities and they have interactions with us, that's where the scoring, the behavioral stuff is going to come into play, and we're going to take those scores, we're going to aggregate them up to the buying group level so that we can understand what that team as a whole is doing. And Alan, I know you've got some uh, you've got some more good tips here around uh, around scoring at the you know at the person level, up at the account level, and even even at the demand unit level. Absolutely, thanks, John. Yeah, th there's a lot to be said in terms of, uh, of scoring at, at all of these levels. And now the reality is that the vast majority of companies that are doing scoring uh, aren't doing a particularly good job of it. You know, there, there's um, there's a lot of folks who's, who've broke up their scores, let's say at a lead level between demographic and firmographic, where they assign 50 points to one, up to 50 points to another, and when it gets to 100, lo and behold, hey, that's an MQL, and we should send that over the fence. Um, but the reality, though, is, is that most companies aren't, aren't really doing a good job with this uh, because, uh, number one, they haven't taken the right approach, and number two, they don't have the right data. Um, the, the first best practice that we recommend, whether you're talking about scoring at the demand unit level or at the lead level, um, is to test out multiple models simultaneously. Uh, most folks in Marketo, for instance, follow the same basic model that everyone else does where, boy, there's a score based on firmographic and, and a score based on uh, behavioral, which is easy to measure, and when they get to 100, you throw it over the fence. What tends to happen is the most important part of the firmographic uh, data doesn't show up, you know, things like company size. Um, the most important part of the demographic information, things like job level and job function, also don't show up. And if you don't have a value, those are scored at zero. And what ends up happening is they become basically behavioral models. Uh, we recommend, uh, number one, um, you try multiple models out. You know, sit down with your sales team and say, here's what I think makes a, a really great lead and have them chime in. Um, and try multiple approaches, run them simultaneously, and then number two, take a scientific approach afterward and go back and see how you did. And you, you might find there's all kinds of interesting things about scoring that are not the way that the conventional wisdom would have you believe. Uh, for example, I have some customers who, who know for certain that particularly at high levels, you know, the C-level audience, unsubscribing is not at all meaningful. Whereas traditionally folks would say, boy, if you've unsubscribed, I've got to make your score either zero or negative 100 or even more negative than that. But the reality is in this day and age where uh, everyone has access to your email address um, and you're getting inundated with emails from folks that you've never heard of before, it's not uncommon for people that really do want to work with you to unsubscribe from those emails. Um, the second thing that is most important, uh, aside from using those models and taking the right approach, is using derived data where it's possible. And I mentioned before, so many companies don't have job level information and job function information, um, and they try working with a data provider, and they get a match rate of only 30% or 40%. So most of them don't get a score for this. Um, it is possible to build your own tools to do this. You know, OpenPrize has one, and, and some other providers do as well. Um, where you can take a look at a series of keywords, uh, rank them, and also rank the value of each of them. So that you could, for example, take a, a, a title like assistant to the vice president of demand generation, derive that, oh yeah, demand generation is definitely part of marketing. So this is a, a job function marketing. Um, and also take a look at keywords like assistant and vice president and say, oh, I know that assistant takes a higher priority than vice president. So this person is an individual contributor, even though they have vice president in their title. Um, it is possible to build that kind of logic yourself or, you know, purchase as a part of an automation solution uh, uh, like ours. But that will make a huge difference in how effective your lead scoring system is. Now, uh, one thing that I think is really important, too, is also to validate you know, each lead that you're throwing over the fence. I, I can't tell you how many times companies are in, in marketing, folks in marketing operations send over a lead that's ASDF at ASDF.com or Mickey Mouse or the names of football players in whatever city they're located. Um, and that really hurts your credibility on the marketing operations side. Uh, an easy way to, uh, to double check this is to validate against a list of bogus names. Um, you know, we have one at Open Prize. We also publish one for free to anyone who wants to download it from marketingopendata.org. 
Um, but definitely take the extra step to validate those names uh, and automate that process so you're not sending over leads that are embarrassing to everyone. Um, and the last best practice that I see in terms of scoring, whether it's accounts or leads or demand units, is to take a look at activity outside of your website and see if there's areas where you can pull that information and make it work. Um, I have one company that's in the data center space that works with us, and they've worked with six different other companies out there that, uh, that publish magazines on data centers. And they found that the very best behavioral scoring isn't on their website, but uh, judging by the articles that, that folks are reading on those other websites, pulling in the IP address information, looking it up, and then pulling it over the fence. So for example, for one of these data center companies that we're working with, when they see that an article from Company X is being read and the article is titled things like uh, data center pricing increases in Southern California, that's a sure sign that there's some interest in that company um, and they may be ready to buy. Uh, so if you can pull in that kind of information as these guys did, you're gonna see a dramatic improvement in, in the quality of uh, the lead scoring you're doing. Now John, I'll turn it over back to you. Yeah, thanks, Alan. And by the way, you just broke my heart. I just now I'm realizing that I haven't had a hundred Tom Brady's inquiring about our services in the last <laughs> quarter. I guess that's not actually him. That's what a shame that is. Um, that's that's great. Thanks, thanks for that, Alan. That was great. Um, really, um, a lot more uh, practical, useful tips uh, in all of that. Um, appreciate that. Um, so this is just kind of a summary here of, uh, of what we talked about in terms of leads versus contacts. Again, some of the more progressive clients that we're seeing are moving away from the lead object. I mean, uh, yeah, excuse me, the lead object in, a, in an effort to move towards demand units. Um, they're focusing really just on the contacts and then associating um, the activities for an individual to the contact object. Um, you know, buying groups are central to figuring out who the demand units are. Um, and so you want to think through what those groups look like, the personas that comprise them. And by the way, that's an exercise that can be done. You know, marketing ops should, should uh, absolutely take the, take the lead in this. But you want to think about gathering information from a few different places. Um, you want to think about uh, talking to certainly your portfolio marketing folks or your product or solutions marketing folks because they'll have a good sense of what those personas are. Um, demand gen folks, because they'll know who's responding to campaigns and who isn't. Um, certainly salespeople, they're right there on the front lines. They'll tell you who's in that buying group and who isn't. Now, they might have a little bit of a, a recency bias. You know, they'll kind of remember the last couple of deals. But then that's where marketing ops comes in, is we can mine past opportunities to figure out what those, um, what those buying groups look like and what those personas might be. So if you can... Um, kind of get all those groups together and, and get consensus on what, again, it's going to be the typical buying groups. It's not going to be perfect for every deal, but kind of playing it down the middle, that's going to be a great thing to think through, um, and it's really going to set you up for being able to do much more targeted marketing to that, to that core audience. And then for scoring, you know, one of, we want to be able to roll the scores up, again, from individuals up to that buying group level. That's important because ultimately we're going to be scoring these demand units. Um, and demand units, again, are an intersection of a buying group that has an interest in a particular solution. So if that same buying group has an interest in a different solution, that's a different demand unit or a different opportunity. So you want to be able to identify you know, who, not only who those people are in the buying group, but again, as they're having interactions with you, how that maps over to a specific solution, because that could mean that there's a different opportunity there for you. And using those scoring thresholds, like Alan uh, indicated, that's going to help you advance um, the opportunities or the demand units through the waterfall based on what that collective, that collective score is. So we're just about at the end here. I want to leave you with uh, a few action items depending on what your role might be. Uh, for marketing operations, you know, I think this message has come through loud and clear here in this webcast. You've got to get that data clean. You really, if you start operating with bad data first, you're just going to be going down a, a bad path. You want to make sure that the activity that's associated to those contacts um, is linked to specific solutions. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's important, again, for the, for the scoring aspect of things. Um, you know, if you're in sales ops, you want to start thinking through, all right, I've got to account for buying groups, the typical buying groups, the actual buying groups, the personas. How am I going to represent that in the Salesforce automation platform? Am I going to create a, a whole host of, 
of specific objects for that? Do I only need to create a couple? Am I going to hard code some of this? Um, that's some of the things you need to start thinking through. From a competency perspective, too, you also want to say, hey, do I have the people on the team now that can do this? Um, do I have to work with maybe an outside agency to stand this up? But also be thinking about what's it going to take to maintain this and the changes that we might have down the line. So, you know, it's all well and good to, to stand up a solution, but do we have the people on staff that are going to understand how it was created and to be able to maintain it going forward? And for the folks in portfolio marketing, and again, that you, know, you, might, you might hear that as product or solutions marketing, um, you're kind of the starting point for what personas go into those buying groups. Um, and you can start to create um, uh, what we call demand maps that will understand uh, what those buying groups may have, uh, the relationship they may have with certain solutions, and that'll give you an indication of what demand units you may uh, need to uh, get created. You don't want to go crazy, by the way, and say, well, everybody could be interested in any one of our solutions or any combination of our products, and so, you know, there's a, a million permutations there. You want to think about what the most typical um, bundled or, or solution-oriented um, offerings are uh, when you do that. So there's something for everybody in here. You know, my main message here, I would say marketing ops, it's in your, the ball's in your court to take the lead on this, really, um, really drive the change in the organization, uh, but there are other teams that need to get involved as well. Yeah, so a couple uh, steps that we can talk about where you can learn more before we hit the Q&A session. Um, we, we mentioned first the importance of data hygiene. If, if you're not really sure of where you are, um, one of the first steps that you can take to help to, do, to get, uh, get the rest of your team behind you and also other teams is to do a diagnostic. Um, and you can do that for free with OpenPrize. We don't charge a bit for that. Uh, what we'll do is hook up our solution into your marketing automation or Salesforce automation solution, and we'll tell you exactly how many missing records you have that are missing contact information, how many bad records, how many duplicate leads and contacts you might have. Um, and once you're able to quantify uh, how bad or how good your data is, it makes it much easier to build a business case around that and to get buy-in from the broader team. Uh, I mentioned the idea of building um, a, a, a data governance template to, to follow up and say, all right, well, you know, here's, uh, here's who owns what fields, here's what the values are going to be, um, and here's how often we're going to update those. Um, there's ones out there for Salesforce, Marketo, Eloqua, and Pardot uh, that you can get from the Open Prize site. And we did touch on a little bit of functionality, although we tried to talk to uh, not cover specific features and functions of the open price solution. If you are interested in seeing a demo, you can see that as well too. Great. Point, I'll, Thank I'll you, turn Alan. It over to you guys for questions. Yep, I'm going to pick it up here. Many, many thanks to John and Alan uh, for some great content. We covered a lot of ground here. And we've got lots of questions coming in from our audience. So uh, our speakers today have definitely generated some, uh, some thoughts among our attendees. So we're going to get right to that. We've got some focused uh, on Alan's presentation, some focused on John's, and, and we'll be able to uh, get answers from both of our speakers. So let's start here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to push the slide out. And we'll be able to see the question and uh, get it answered. So Alan, I think. This one was for you. How do you suggest that one would go about testing different models, and how exactly would one track those or test them against one another? So I know uh, you indicated that you'd, you'd like to be able to answer that. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so th this is really important. As I mentioned before, you know, many companies simply follow what everyone else is doing. Um, there are some basic standards that, that folks in, in some of the major marketing automation solution providers suggest. You know, one of them is dividing a score up um, where a maximum of 50 points can come from um, the demographic score and firmographic score, and uh, you can have as many points as you want on the behavioral side. Um, I, I think that's, uh, while, while that's a good basic approach, it, it probably doesn't relate to uh, most companies that are out there. Um, people have unique content on the website. Some people have a page or two that are relevant. Other folks have interactive uh, uh, tools that you can do that could mean spending a whole lot more time on the website. Uh, some companies uh, do a whole lot of webcasts. Some of them have small demo mm -hmm. vignettes. Um, and each of them needs to be scored differently. Uh, but my suggestion is that you sit down with all the things that you think could possibly um, reflect a, uh, someone who's a buyer ready to buy, 
um, and you take a crack at it. And you do the exact same exercise with a couple members of your inside sales team who probably have really strong views. You know, they may focus more on email opens um, and responses back and forth from their, their nurturing stream. Uh, you may have people in the field who say, well, you know, boy, the most important thing is that interaction at a field event. Um, and what you can do is, with a lot of tools like Open Prize, is create multiple scoring models and test them out simultaneously and, and see what really works best for you. I mentioned that example before of how unsubscribes tend to have, at, at some of the companies that we're working with at the C-level, unsubscribes have absolutely nothing to do with whether a, a, a prospect is interested in talking with you or not. What you can do then, once you have these multiple models, is, is you can run them all. Uh, let's say your sales cycle is 30 days, then you would probably run these models for 60 or 90 days. And then go back and take a look at, at how each of those scores reflected in opportunities and revenue that was created. And if you do that, then you have a more pragmatic view of what's working and what doesn't. And, and you might find out all kinds of interesting things that you thought were really important and maybe not. You know, we, we found, for instance, um, in some organizations that offer workshops, there are great indication of when someone is ready to buy when people volunteer for that. Uh, in other cases, it's not the case. But, you know, taking that quantitative approach and then going back after you've run the models for a certain amount of time, depending on how long your sales cycle is, and going back and comparing the two will do amazing things in established in credibility um, and uh, putting together better models that result in more revenue. Um, so yeah, take it the extra steps. Um, if there's one thing I can emphasize, it's, it's not to do whatever you did at your previous company um, and put some more thought into it and then test those models out. All right, John, did you want to add anything on to Alan's answer or ready to move on? No, that was pretty complete. I know we have some other uh, questions in the queue, so um, uh, yeah. maybe we can get to those. Yeah. Let's go to let's get to this next one, um, and it, it was directed to you, John. And uh, this attendee also mentioned that he thought you touched on the answer, uh, but he would love you to expand. John, you mentioned using a custom object to identify a buying group. What are the pros and cons for using the opportunity object instead, with it set at stage zero? The idea that you build engagement and then get that buying group uh, to progress opportunity stages that gets into the pipeline. Yeah, great, great question. Super, super tactical. So um, the custom object we've seen um, our clients that have adopted the domain unit waterfall creating is actually for the buying group contact. So um, a custom object at the contact level. Um, again, it's to be able to account for the score at that, um, at that level um, because you can't update the, uh, the contact role object. So that's, that's been the big thing. And then um, the idea is that uh, most of them are using the opportunity object to represent um, the demand unit. And again, that the, uh, the demand unit is a combination of the buying group that has an interest in a certain solution. So it's a kind of a loose proxy for the buying group, but again, it's, it's specific to a certain solution. So that's exactly what they're doing. They're kind of doing away with leads. They're saying, hey, we're going to reset all these stages. So if we had, you know, five lead stages and then eight opportunity stages, well now we're going to have 13 opportunity stages and we're going to start with a stage zero opportunity and we're going to run it through. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a shift. Um, at some of our clients we've seen sales loves it because they are dealing with opportunities all the time. They actually don't pay that much attention to leads or, or know, the way, know their way around the lead object all that well, so it's a, a welcome change. Um, other clients, there's been a little bit of pushback from the sales team saying, whoa, don't mess with how we've defined our opportunity stages. We know what a stage one is. We know what a stage two is. You know, that's going to be um, a big uh, change management issue to, to go through. But, but essentially, opportunity, the opportunity object is a great proxy for a demand unit, and that's what we're seeing is people are using, um, are using that. Now, you can, um, you know, for, for organizations that, again, are pushing back on don't mess with our opportunity object, they may create a different object that handles the, um, the early stage, essentially what this was the same as leads, um, and then they'll move it over to an opportunity object. It's kind of a workaround. Um, the cleanest way really to do it is to just use opportunities all the way through and, um, and just kind of work through that political change at your organization. But great, great, great question. Alan, anything you want to add to that? 
Uh, no, I, I think that that's dead on. Uh, you know, this is a really a tough topic as people are thinking about tweaking their uh, their Salesforce solutions to to more effectively measure really how a sale takes place. Uh, so I think you did a great job in covering that one. All right, I'm going to put this question up there. We'll see if we can get to one or two more, um, and it might not be something that you guys are familiar with. John, I'll ask you first. We had this attendee asked about an approach called magnet marketing to um, identify right. buying groups. Does that ring a bell, uh, Al, uh, John, for you or Alan? It, it does not for me. Alan, have you heard of that? Uh, I'm sorry. I haven't heard of that one either, so I, I don't think I can answer yeah. that okay. one. Yeah, so, so I'm not sure. The only thing I'd, yeah, I just real quick, Karen. I just say, you know, I just reiterate that um, what I was saying there in kind of the summary is, if you can get input from sales and some data mining from marketing ops and input from demand um, and portfolio marketing, to uh, I guess that's four points, so it wouldn't really be triangulating, but to get all those points of view um, together, um, you can start to get a pretty good sense of what those typical buying groups um, look like. So whether that's Similar to magnet marketing or not, I'm not sure, but um, that's what we've seen work best. All right, good. Well, let's let's uh, sort of end on this one then, talking about uh, working together across departments. Our sales team doesn't think scoring is useful. What should I say to convince them that it is? And Alan, I'll let you start on this one, and we'll we'll hear from both of you on it because it's a good question. Sure. Yeah, we, we touched on this a bit, um, but I think there's a couple steps you can take here. Um, the, the reality is in, in an awful lot of companies that we talk with, the, the scoring system really isn't working and it really isn't valuable. And so the, the first thing that I would recommend that person do is sit down with that, that inside sales and field team and talk with them about you know, what they see as indicators that are and aren't. Um, I, again, it, it's amazing. There is no one universal answer for this. Um, and the, the tools that, that and assets that each marketing team can bring to bear vary dramatically from company to company. So it, it makes sense to, to start from scratch, uh, you know, build out the model and reach agreement about it. And you know, where there are some areas that people aren't really sure is to test out multiple models. I, I think if you, ha if you build a model and you don't involve sales and you don't involve uh, the inside team, chances are it's not going to get uh, a, a whole lot of feedback and it isn't going to be very well received. Um, those guys who are in the trenches every day have a tremendous amount of, uh, of knowledge about what their prospects are looking for and you, you definitely want to sit down and engage them first and then meet with them periodically, you know, every two weeks or every three weeks to go back and review some scores and say, hey, did this work out right? Did this not work out right? And, and do that even before you get to the point where deals are closed and you can go back and do your review. Um, you know, getting your, your sales team engaged in the process um, throughout from beginning to end will make a tremendous difference and it will help you make, make those folks into the advocates that you need them to be. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree, um, Alan. I think that's great advice. And really the answer to that question is in the way it was phrased. What should I say to convince them? It's not a matter of convincing them. It's a matter of working with them to try and fine-tune that scoring model. Um, the highest performing organizations we've seen do exactly what you described. The marketing ops person, whoever it is, is in the back pocket. They're, they're, they're tied at the hip with, um, with the sales folks to say, hey, we created this algorithm. How is it working out for you? You know, does, does it make sense? If it doesn't make sense, let me understand why not. I'll go back. I'll fix it. I'll show you how I fixed it or tweaked it, and let me see if that um, uh, made any difference. Uh, just a couple other things uh, in terms of how you do that, because sometimes the, you know, the soft stuff is the hard stuff. And so um, you can either work with reps that are really open to the idea of scoring um, and are easy to work with in general, um, and you work with them to fine-tune the process, or sometimes if you can convert that, you know, that sales rep that's sitting in the back of the room with his arms folded, who is the doubter and the skeptic, if you can work with that person and convert them, that goes a long way culturally towards getting everybody on board. Uh, and that person's peers to saying, oh, wow, if that guy's up, bought in, then it must really work. Um, so a couple of different approaches there that I, that I think um, may help, just a layer on top of what, what Alan had said. Yeah, that, that, that's well, a good, good point, John. You, yeah, you, um, you definitely want to involve that guy who has his arms crossed and doesn't want to talk with you. That's the guy that you want to work with and get engaged and, yeah. and, and get personally vested in the project. Yeah. 
All right, good. Well, thank you both. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Uh, thank you, John and Alan, for a very informative and timely presentation. And I want to thank our audience for your great questions. We didn't get to all of them, but do not worry. We will be passing all your questions along to our friends at Open Prize, and they will be getting back to you with answers. I do want to give a special thank you to our sponsor, Open Prize, which you can visit at www.openprizetech.com. That's all for our broadcast today. We look forward to seeing you next time right here at Digital Marketing Depot.